Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. All right. We have some more vitamin people over here. Praise God. God's good. Yep. All right. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. We are going to have some fun this morning. All right? It says, And it shall come to pass in the last days. Say last days. Okay, now understand this. We are in the last days. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men, that's you, Elijah, shall see visions. Your old men, that's you, Jerry, shall dream dreams. That's going to happen. When's it going to happen? It's going to happen right now. And Jesus is coming back soon. The Bible tells us that at the end of two days, which is a 2,000 years, that Jesus is coming back. And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. The trumpet of God will sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. Why will they rise first? Because the Bible says so. Why do we need to be told they're going to rise first? Because evidently there's going to be enough time there that when they rise first, those of us who remain don't get freaked out. And then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the air. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, mortality will drop off. We'll take on immortality. We'll all be changed. And then we spend seven years with Jesus in heaven where we have the marriage supper of the Lamb and the judgment seat of Christ, which is not judging your salvation. It's an awards ceremony. Because the only people who are going to be there are people who have made it. But here on this earth, it's a different situation for the next seven years. We have not been appointed to wrath, but the world has been. But we're told that coming up to this time, coming up to this time when Jesus returns for the church, which he's coming back for a glorious church, you're going to see a dichotomy of of positions here on this earth when Jesus returns. You're going to have the church over here that's glorious, And you're going to have the world over here that's a mess. And he's coming back for the glorious church. But in these last days, things are going to happen. In the church, there's going to be dreams and visions and prophecy, and things are going to get brighter. Jesus never said, when you go into the world, your light's going to go out. No. He said, let your light so shine before men, that they see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. The church is going to be shining. Your friends and neighbors should be able to know that you're a Christian. They shouldn't have to come up to you and say, are you a Christian? Because they they should be able to tell. Now there's times, I I, uh, was over at the hospital a few weeks ago and, and there was one of the nurses and she talked to me I bet she didn't have two sentences out of her mouth, and I knew she was a born-again believer. You could tell by by the way she spoke, what she said. The world doesn't use words like blessed. You can tell, you can tell real quick when somebody's a believer. And I turned to her and I said, You're a born again Christian, aren't you? Yes, I am. I didn't even tell her I was a pastor. So in the last days, the church is going to be bright. I said the church is going to be bright. Hmm. And you should light up a room by entering it. Some people light up a room by leaving it. That shouldn't be you. <laughs> but now the world, that's a different thing. Look at 2 Timothy 3.1. It says, but know this, and we've been talking about this a little bit. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous times. Now that's talking about the world. In the world, before the return of Jesus, there's going to be perilous times. 
That word perilous, and I believe I shared this with you last week, but I, I, you've got to get this. That word perilous is only used in the Greek text of the New Testament two times. It's used here describing the times that are going to be when Jesus returns of the world. And it's used one other time. And it's when Jesus got off the boat and there was a madman there. They call him the madman of the Gadarenes. That's, that's what people call him. And he ran naked through the tombs at night and terrorized all of the surrounding villages. And he was so violent, so strong, that they chained this guy down. And it says in the Bible that the demonic spirits within him gave him such supernatural strength that he literally broke the chains and the shackles and continued terrorizing the people. And when Jesus got off the boat, this man came up to Jesus. Now, Robbie has got a, a real good message on that. You can look it up on YouTube and get the whole story. But what I want you to know today is the description describing that man was the other place where it uses that Greek word. So basically this, that man was ragingly insane. In the last days, perilous times will come. In the world, there's going to be raging insanity. And let me ask you this. When you hear people talk on television and they don't have a smile on their face, they're not telling a joke and they say something, have, have you ever thought to yourself, they are ragingly insane. People are saying things with a straight face that 30 or 40 years ago would have been a joke or something that we would laugh at because it would be so ridiculous. I mean, we're at the point today, if, if you see two guys in coveralls with red and black plaid shirts, flannel, and they got a chainsaw in their hand and, and a big beard, and you see two of these guys walking down the street holding hands and getting all lovey-dovey, if you say anything about it, you're the problem. <laughs> Have you thought about this? You're the problem. Because you think, listen to me, because you think it's not normal for two lumberjacks to be lovey dovey. Oh, just, sweetheart, set your chainsaw down over there and I'll set mine here. You gotta be kidding me. That's what Matlock would say. Oh, come on. Know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. There's going to be times of raging insanity in the world. Look what it says. For men will be lovers of themselves. I know some people that love themselves so much that if anybody else fell in love with them, they'd get jealous. <laughs> I mean, people, it's, it's all about me. It's all about me. Myself and me, living free with me, is what I want to be. I mean, the world is nuts. But we shouldn't be. And we are supposed to love others. Do you see, do you see the problem here? We are supposed to love others. The world is all about loving themselves. If I can get gratification for me, I mean, hey, if it feels good, do it. If it feels good to what? Your flesh. As Christians, we're, if it seems good to your spirit, do it. See the difference? It's subtle. But men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. I'm not going to talk much about this because I talked about it quite a bit the last few weeks. But it's, there's nothing wrong with having money. But there's something wrong with loving it. Boasters, proud. You know, we, we've got to the point where we're, we're proud of stuff. Did you know that the Bible says 
that it's wrong to be proud of things? Pride cometh before a fall. Pride, there is there's no such thing as good pride. Remember that commercial a few years ago? Chevy Pride. That's ignorant. <laughs> I got that word from my mom. That's ignorant. <laughs> I mean, I know of a guy a few years ago who was a well, actually, he wasn't a Chevy Pride guy. He was a Ford guy. He had a Ford F-150. Is that what they call it? F-1. He had a Ford pickup, and he, he loved this thing, and he polished this thing. And, and when it would get a little spot on it, he would fix it all up, and he was a Ford man. And I asked him one day why he bought a Ford. I said, why do you like Ford so much? My daddy was a Ford man. My grandpa was a Ford man. And I'll die a Ford man. And I was thinking to myself, no, you're just going to die stupid. Because... If, if you buy something because somebody else bought it. And you know what he did one day? He pulled up at a parking lot, and this guy had a Chevy. And he actually got in trouble for this. But he, he pulled up, and this guy had a Chevy pickup. He took his tire tool out and dented the guy's truck. Because he had pride in his Ford. See, pride is not good. People say, well, I've got good pride. I don't, I don't have bad pride. I've got good pride. You know, well, that's dumb. The Bible says pride's a sin. That's like saying, no, I don't have bad adultery. I've got good adultery. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's no such thing as good sin. That's an oxymoron. It's either right or it's wrong. Somebody says, well, come on. It's okay to be proud of things. No, it's not. See, that's a lie. You're believing fake news. It is not okay to have pride. Somebody said, well, I have pride in my school. Yeah, and that's why there's fights at football games. That's why there's fights at soccer games, because all the people sitting on one side wearing yellow and green, for this soccer team of this country, they don't like the people sitting over there you know, wearing blue and orange. And so the blue and orange people fight the green people because they got pride. Jesus, God never said, when Jesus got baptized, God didn't say this is my beloved son. Boy, am I proud of him. He didn't say that. Why? Because pride is all about me. It's what I want. I don't care about you. You say, well, you know, here in Camdenton we got Laker pride. Well, I'm trying to change that. But, but reality. Somebody says, well, I, when I said I was proud of of my family and I'm proud of my church. Don't ever say you're proud of your church. We don't need to have competition between churches. People say, well, I'm proud of my church. But don't be proud of your church. Well, we're not like that church down the street. No, we're not. They're down the street. But they believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. We're not in competition with other churches. Come on, let's, let's get real. So when somebody says they're, they're proud of something, I had somebody say, well, you know, I am proud of my son. You know what I mean. That's not what I really, I don't mean I'm proud. Well, let me give you a thought. Have you ever thought about saying what you mean? I didn't mean it that way. Well, say what you mean. Well, what can you say? What can I say about my son? I can say this. I can say what God said. This is my son, and I'm well pleased. See, why well, that doesn't sound right? Well, say it a few times and it'll start sounding right. You know? This is my church and I'm well pleased. I'm grateful. I'm thankful. Those are all good things. But not pride. I'm proud. Ain't nobody going to say nothing about my church. I'll give them the old five-fold ministry. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Okay. But the world is going to be prideful. Have you ever seen such pride? Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. See, and this is when people feel entitled. You know, everybody should give to me because I exist. I'm here. Feed me. Buy me clothes. Give me a cell phone. Give me the internet. Give me housing. 
give me, give me, give me. What is that? That's focusing on you again. Entitlement. <laughs> the Bible has a, an interesting thought about this. You don't work, you don't eat. You say, well, that doesn't sound nice, but it's Bible. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, take it up with, like, Jesus. Don't complain to me. Uh, it's, it's like the Bible. Well, I don't necessarily believe all that stuff that's in there anyway. That's your problem. See, what I've noticed over the years, and for everyone in this church, and probably if I looked around, probably everybody's been in my office at one time or another. Okay? So don't be thinking I'm talking about you. But let me tell you something about you. <laughs> now, a lot of people, they kind of like come to your office if you're in the ministry to find out what you think they should do or what the Bible says so that they can leave and then debate and decide whether they're going to do it or not. See, what you've got to establish is God's Word is true. It's truth, but it's true. And the only way that you're going to get your life sorted out and get everything sorted out with God, is just make this commitment in your heart that if that's what the Word says, that's what I believe. If the Word says it, and you say, well, but I haven't been, I wasn't brought up that way. My church, my denomination didn't believe that. Well, believing what your denomination says is not what you, gets you set free. You want to get set free? Jesus said this when he was talking to his disciples in John 8, 31 and 32. He said, if you abide in my word. He didn't say if you abide in your church doctrine. He didn't say if you abide in your church constitution. He, said if you, he didn't say if you abide in the laws of the land. He said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, there's a lot of people wanting to get set free, but they're not wanting to abide in His Word. They want to dabble in His Word. Well, this is not a Brill Cream religion. This is not a little dabble, do you? Except in Jerry's case, a little dab will do him. <laughs> How many of you know what Brill Cream is? Yeah. How many of you remember I Pan a Toothpaste? How many of you remember the commercial? Tell, let, let me ask you how politically correct this is. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. <laughs> there must have been a lot of people with yellow teeth for that commercial to have gone over. Somebody somewhere in some advertising place had to say, we've got to do something about these yellow teeth. Because <laughs> that was a national commercial. You'll wonder where the yellow went. Come on now. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. So when you go home from church today and somebody says, what would you guys sing at church? <laughs> You'll wonder where... All right. Slanderers without self-control. Oh my goodness. How many of these shooters have been interviewed, the ones that survived, have been interviewed and they said, well, I just didn't have control of myself. One guy said, I was listening to voices. I went in the building, and the, they told me who to shoot. Do you think, possibly, just possibly, that the Bible is right? That there are demonic spirits that speak to us in these days? And see, you have a choice in who you listen to. I said, you have a choice in who you listen to. I'm going to ask you this right now, and we're going to come back to this in just a minute for a short time. Who are you listening to? You got problems in your life? You got problems with your kids? You got problems with your money? You got problems in your marriage? You got problems in politics? You got problems in the community? Who are you listening to? Have you ever stopped to think that these problems that are following you around might be you? I say that in love. Please come back to church. <laughs> but I had a man tell me one time, he said, and this is a true story, he said, man, my wife went out to get the mail. 
And she's standing at the mailbox out there in our community, and the next door neighbor's wife came out. She was getting her mail, and the mailbox was right next to each other. He said, in about five minutes, I don't know what happened, but in about five minutes, they were down on the ground having a punch fight, you know, hitting each other in the face, just a fist fight between these two women. He said, so we sold our house. We moved across town. He said, but the weirdest thing, the other day my wife was going out to get the mail. And our neighbor went out to get the mail. He said, I don't know how we picked two people in this town. The one to get in fistfights. He didn't see the common denominator here. He could have moved 12 times. There had been 12 fistfights. Oh, well. Quit sending your wife to get the mail. First thing. <laughs> Okay, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God? Well, okay, boy, that's an hour. I'm not going to go there. Now look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such people, turn away from them. Now this is, this is to the church talking about in the last days when perilous times will come, here's going to be the condition, and here's my instruction to you. It's what Paul said. Here's my instruction to you, church. From these people, don't make them your best friends. Because who you hang out with is who you're going to listen to. And who you listen to affects you. The Bible says... The, here's what the Bible says word for word. The company of fools will make you a fool. Well, that's just there in the Bible someplace. Yes, it is. It's there in the Bible someplace. It's the Word of God. Don't hang out with fools. Tell that to your high school kids. Tell that to the junior high kids. Find somebody. It doesn't matter if they're a geek or if they're a sports person. If they're ugly, if they're pretty, short, fat, skinny, tall, that poor rich doesn't make any difference. Find somebody that loves God and hang around with them. See, we, we judge who we hang around with by how popular they are, especially in places like high school. High school kids all want to hang around the popular kid. They think hanging around the popular kid will make you popular. Let me tell you something. I'm old enough to know a lot of these popular kids from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Some of them turned out to be raging idiots. Some of them turned out good. But they didn't turn out good or bad because they were popular. Let me tell you something. Fame is nothing. Fame is nothing. Obedience is everything. All right. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What does that mean? What is a form of godliness, but denying the power? Let me tell you something. I have, I have been to churches. I have, I have been to churches that were so, excuse the term, and I, dead. Because they didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They didn't believe in this, in, they don't believe that the spirit world exists. They don't believe angels are here to assist you, like the Bible says. They don't believe that demons are here to torment you, like the Bible says. They ignore all this stuff, but they still come to, come to the church building and they sing their song and they listen to a little 20 minute homily about uh, how we should all be good citizens in the community. And then they go home and they say, Well, I went to church that week. No, you had a form of godliness, but you denied the power. See, we need to recognize the power of God. You need to understand that Psalm 103.20 says that angels are standing by. They are great in strength, and they are waiting to hear the Word of God spoke from your mouth so that they can do what God's Word says in your life. Hebrews says angels are ministering spirits sent here to minister for the saints, for those who will inherit salvation. That's us. Angels are ministering spirits. But they just don't randomly minister. 
Psalm 103, 20. They're waiting to hear the voice of God's Word spoken, and then they're going to enact it. Who speaks God's Word? You do. But let me tell you something. If you don't believe in any of that, you won't. If you don't believe that your words mean anything, then your words will destroy you. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's what the Scripture says. Jesus said, by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And then in that same passage, he says, and watch those little words you say that you don't think mean anything. Watch those idle words. Those are the words that will justify you or condemn you. We have authority over all the power of the enemy, but if you don't believe the enemy is here, look, a lot of, there's a lot of churches that are just social. They don't even believe Jesus is coming back. I, I spoke at a convention here at the Lake of the Ozarks of a major denomination. And I'm standing out on the balcony and I talked about the return of Jesus. And I've just got done speaking to all of their ministers that have come in from around the, the country. But, which, by the way, they had to send a van down to the First Baptist Church in Camdenton to get Bibles because none of them brought Bibles. They said, well, we knew that you had a Baptist background and you'd probably be speaking out of the Bible, so we went down and borrowed Bibles from the Baptist Church. Well, yeah, I'm going to be speaking out of the Bible. What do you think we're going to talk out of? The New York Times? Or the USA Today? The phone book? Hello? So I... I, I taught these people about how the Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. Jesus is coming back for His church. So I'm standing outside with the guy who's kind of like in charge. He's the one that invited me, and he had his little robe on and his little funny hat and all that. And uh, he, said, he said, that was really good, what you said in there. Now we're looking over the Lake of the Ozarks, holding onto the rail at this resort. I said, well, thank you. He said, he said of course... You and I know. You know, he starts to talk like we know more than all of them. You and I know Jesus has already come back. And he's living in our hearts. And he's ruling and reigning on this earth right now. Implying that we were in the millennium or something. He said Jesus is, Jesus is on the throne right now, ruling and reigning on this earth. And I looked back at him and I said, wow, he's doing a pretty crummy job. <laughs> if Jesus is in charge and this is what we got <laughs> somebody's not ruling and reigning properly <laughs> but the world even, even church sometimes says holding to a form of godliness but denying the power what do you do? turn away from these people now I'm just going to put look I'm not into numbers. I just do what I'm supposed to do. God's in charge of numbers. Whether we have a church of 500 or 5,000 or whether we have 1,000 or 20,000 watching online. That, that's not the point. I'm just supposed to say what I'm supposed to say. But I'll tell you what that says in modern vernacular. Don't go to that church. And from such, such ministers, don't go there. Who are you listening to? Who, who, who have you been listening to? Wow. Well, let's take a look at another uh, scripture. Let's take a look at... Uh, ah, I was looking at this up in my office. I, I kind of like this. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's turn over there. You got your Bibles? It's on my phone. Well, get out your phone. You know the problem with with reading it on a phone, and I have an iPad, and I've got all the Bible apps on an iPad, is I can't turn the pages down and mark them and draw little arrows and highlight. I like doing that. In fact, I have to rotate my Bibles about, about every two years I have to go to the bookstore and get a new Bible because all my pages are falling out and they're all marked up. And somebody says, well, what do you do with your old Bibles? Well, I've got a stack of Bibles in there. Okay, First Timothy uh, chapter 4. And verse 1. Let's take a look at this. Now the Spirit, who says this? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed, that means they're going to listen to and act upon, 
deceiving spirits. These are not angels of God. These are demonic spirits. Listening to deceiving spirits and doctrines, which is a Greek word, didaskalos, which is not translated. It should have been. That means teaching. And teachings of demons. Well, how are you going to get taught by a demon? You're going to be listening to somebody you shouldn't listen to. I, I know of people who have scanned the internet. There are a lot of good teaching on the internet. I'm telling you, there's a lot of good teaching on the internet. A lot of good teaching on the internet. But you've got to know who you're listening to. I know of people that have found somebody on the internet. They found one message that kind of sounded good. They locked in and started to listen to all their messages. And next thing you know, they're doubting whether God is an astronaut or not. You know, you got to watch who you listen to. You need to make sure that that you subject yourself to teachers that are grounded in the Word of God and not grounded in some kind of philosophy. Look at this. Doctrines of demons. Let's go on to the next verse. Verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. What's that mean? Well, it's kind of like that guy that stood out by the rail with me. He let me preach one thing, but then he believed something else. You need people, you need to set yourself under teachers in these last days who actually believe and live what they're teaching you. You don't want somebody that's preaching one thing and living something else. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What does that mean? That means that they have done things wrong so long that their conscience is seared and they don't even see it as wrong anymore. They're living something that's not right but they've done it so long and they've ignored the truth and they've divorced themselves from hearing from God that they, they think it's right. You know, there's a lot of people doing wrong that think it's right. Well, how can that be? They've seared their conscience. Next verse. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Who is the person who believes and knows the truth? That's us. That's talking about the church of Jesus Christ that believes and knows the truth. Don't tell somebody not to marry because God doesn't like marriage. Or if you go to someone's house and they serve you food, don't kick back and act like you can't eat it because of some religious reason. If it's served to you, this is what the Bible's talking about, eat what's placed before you. It depends on the circumstance. You don't go down to the temple and eat food sacrificed to idols just because you can. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you may be in a situation where somebody has given their best. Trust me, I've been in foreign countries. <laughs> I was in a country one time and the little suction cups off the octopus's leg was still... They, they, I, I thought I saw a move. Loretta said they didn't move. I, I thought I saw a move. Man, this... Did you just cut this leg off? <laughs> but with water in my eyes, I ate it. Because to them, it was a delicacy. And to them... It was the best they had. And to them, they were giving honor to the man of God who had preached the word at their church that day. And for me to go, oh, that's not good enough for me. Are you following me? Okay. Verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused. That doesn't say you go get it. We're talking about kind of a circumstance like what I was in here. Nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. Look at verse 5. For it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. Wow, this is good. Now look at verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, now he's talking now here to Timothy. And here's what he told him. You know all the things we just discussed? Now listen to what he says. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. I have young ministers come up to me and say, hey, how can I be a good minister? I'll tell you what. Here's what Paul says. You instruct the brethren in these things, and you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ 
nourished in the words of faith. People want to know why I call myself a word of faith minister? Because all through the New Testament, that's the only place, the only type of message that they say we're supposed to preach as ministers. Words here, words of faith. And of the good doctrine or teaching which you have carefully followed. Wow. Is this good or what? Hmm. Drop down to verse 11. There's a lot of things that we could read here, and for sake of time, I'm not going to be able to. But these things, now he told, he told Timothy, these things, here's what you tell the brethren. You teach these things, but you command these things too. Well, how do you command things? Well, there's, there's some things. If you read that, it says, we shouldn't have profanity. And we're not going to have profanity in the church. I, I can't control you at home. But I can control you here. i got two guys that are packing. They'll escort you out. If you, you start using God's name in vain, we're not going to put up with it in the house of God. Okay, you know, I'm going to command that. You want to come to church nude? We're not going to allow it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We have a naked man or woman come in and sit on the back row or the front row or any row. The ushers are going to close their eyes and take them out. And when I say take them out, there's two ways we can take them out. <laughs> we can take them out of the building and if they won't go, in love, in love. In love. What, what we, everything we do, we do in love. Right, Elijah? Everything's in love. Okay. God is good. Okay, let's turn in our Bibles over to Genesis. And uh, let's take a look at chapter 3. And I want to just bring up one verse. Remember that Adam and Eve sinned. Eve was deceived, Adam sinned, and they realized that they were naked. And follow me on this. It doesn't mean they were nude. I know we've got pictures all over the place of Adam and Eve, you know. And it does say that they, they tried to cover themselves. But they were covered with the glory of God when they were in the garden. They're covering their covering was the glory of God. The manifested presence of the Lord was upon them. When they sinned, Ichabod, the glory departed. And when the glory departed, they were naked. They didn't have the glory. And so God talks to them, and they said, well, we did this because we were naked. I want to sh show you one thing that God said here. In chapter 3, verse 11. If we could get that up on the board. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And he said, Who told you you were naked? In other words, who have you been talking to? Who have you been talking to that's messed you up? Who have you been listening to? And I'll tell you what, I think the church, we need to understand this. In the last days, there's going to be a glorious church, and in the last days, there's going to be a ragingly insane world. And the, the world is going to be calling what is right, wrong, and they're going to be calling what is wrong, right. They're going to, they're going to be all mixed up. It's just going to be goofy. The church is not going to be. But in order for us to have the clarity of what God wants for us, in order for us to have the truth to set us free, we got to watch who we listen to. we got to watch who we hang around with. We, we, we cannot take fools. Now look, that doesn't mean you can't witness to a fool. Are you following me? We all know people that are out there. And we want to witness to them. 
but you don't bring them into your inner circle. Well, a guy was telling me the other day, yeah, but Jesus ate with the Republicans and the sinners, or excuse me, the publicans and the sinners. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, ate, Jesus ate with the publicans and the sinners. Is that true? Preacher, preacher, is that true? Well, yeah, it's true. Jesus ate with the publicans and sinners. That doesn't mean you can't have a meal with somebody that's a mess. But when Jesus went to raise the girl who was dead back to life, he didn't say, let's go get the publicans and the sinners and break. No, he put everybody out except his inner circle. It says he shut everybody else out, and Peter, James, and John went in, and the girl came back to life. When you want to get business done, you need to have yourself surrounded with your inner circle, and your inner circle has got to be godly. Doesn't mean you can't go out and let your light shine in a bad place. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean you can't have an acquaintance who's not saved or whatever. I've known people that they got saved and they read a scripture that says don't associate with whatever and they, they wouldn't talk to their dad because he was a lost person or they wouldn't talk to their brother. And I, I knew of one man that cut out all of the inheritance of his kids because they're lost and the Bible says I'm not to associate with them. No, that's not what it's talking about. What it says is don't bring them into your inner circle. Don't make them your friends. And that word, don't associate with fools, that means, that word associate there in the Hebrew means bring them in to you. Don't, don't bring them in and start listening to them. Because if you listen to the world, see look, here's the deal. You are, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, you are spirit, soul, and body. You're a three-part being. When you got born again, when you got born again, the Holy Spirit moved inside of your spirit. Follow me? You are indwelled. As Billy Graham says, you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now there's other things pertaining to the Holy Spirit beyond that, but when you receive Jesus, old things pass away, all things become new, you're a new creation in Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Living, living inside your spirit. Actually, it's correct to say it this way, you are possessed by the Spirit of God. Woo well, in God there is no darkness. Darkness and light can't occupy the same space at the same time. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's not going to say, come on devil, you can live with me. No, when God's in you, there is no darkness at all. What that means is, is as a Christian, born again, you can be tormented by demonic spirits. You can be affected by demonic spirits but you cannot be possessed by a demonic spirit. Why? Because you are already possessed by the Spirit of God. Are you following me? But here's what you've got to understand. People who are not Christians do not have the Spirit of God in them. And scripturally, they can be possessed. And you don't want to make that person somebody that you listen to and take their advice I mean, the last thing in the world you want to do if you're having problems with, with your marriage is go down to the local pub and find some guy sitting there half tanked out of his head that's been married nine times and he's gone to jail for wife abuse or whatever and say, what should I do? <laughs> and people do that. Well, he should know. He's been married nine times. He's got a lot of experience in these things. <laughs> Are you following me? The, the reality is, what about going to the Word of God? I can guarantee you God knows more than him. And there's a possibility he might be demon-possessed. And what does the enemy want for you? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. And how does he do that? Through the words that you believe that are spoken by the enemy. Wow. So God said, who told you? See, have you ever done something and after you've done it, you thought, wow, that was stupid. <laughs> or am I the only one? And then you start thinking back, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And then you think of somebody that gave you the advice. Oh, yeah. I remember now. We were sitting out there looking over the lake, and I said, what should I do? It sounded pretty good at the time. 
The words of the enemy always sound good at the time. That's why it's called deception. Let, let me tell you something. The person being deceived, they don't know they're deceived. Why? Because it's deception. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's what deception is. It's when somebody who does something based upon what is wrong, they think it's right, and you try to tell them what they're doing is not right, and try to show them what is right, and they won't believe you. Why? Because they think that what they're doing is right. They are deceived. And one of the worst types of deception is self-deception. And that's another message. Well, praise God. I love you guys. You know that, don't you? I, uh, I was told here a few weeks ago, man, you've been, you know, you've been really hard on us. One guy told me out in the atrium, he says, my toes hurt. And I said, that's, that's not good. I wanted you to hurt all over. <laughs> all I got was your toes. <laughs> but look, here's the whole thing. My job is, and you do know I love you. I, I do. I, I, I look around this room, I can't think of anybody here I, I wouldn't take a bullet for. I mean it. I love you guys. But God has not called me to make you like me. And that, that's a tough, tough place for a, a minister to be in. I want you to like me. I want you to like me. But he didn't call me to say things to make you like me. He called me to say things that will help us all, me included, as a body of believers to get set free from the stuff that comes at us. In the last, in the last 24 hours, brought to me has been someone who had a child suddenly die this weekend. In the last 24 hours, what was brought to me was a man who says, my granddaughter is 14 years old and she's having twins and we just found out. I mean, and I could, I could name a couple of other things. Let me tell you something. These are all Christians. The enemy is coming to attack our families. This is not the time to back off. This is a time to double our efforts, get stronger in the faith, hold up our shield of faith even stronger than we ever have. People say, well, you know, it hasn't worked so far. <laughs> then build a stronger shield. Because something hasn't worked so far, don't give up. Just double your efforts to be stronger in the Word. And Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. And then he goes on to say, and nothing, no thing, shall by any means harm you. Well, we say, we're, we're not quite to that place yet. Okay, that's not the thing. Let's get to that place. Let's get to that place where we are a strong body of believers. And when the world sees us, we, we probably still have the same problems they have, but we don't handle them the way they handle them. And we come out where maybe they get bogged down going through the problem and a tail spin down. We get into that problem and we have our shield of faith and the Word of God and we come out the other side stronger. We have something the world does not have. We have the ultimate power of the universe. And He has sent His angels. And we are in command of them simply by speaking. We don't command them, say, hey, go get me a drink of water. No. But we are in command of them by speaking God's Word. And they will enact God's Word in our life for us. They will do what you can't do, is what the Scripture says. And they'll do it for you as a believer. If you say what God says. And you'll say what God says if He's the one you've been listening to. But if you listen to the world, you'll say what they say. And that leaves the angels on the bench waiting to hear God's Word. Is anybody going to say God's Word? Hmm. Oh, ha! oh, no, He said, this is killing me. No, He said, I'll never get through this. Oh, he asked a question. What did he say? What are we going to do? 
And the angels, they're waiting for somebody to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay, now I can operate. And they get up and they help you do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You that Your Word is truth and true. And Father, we submit to You in all that we say and do. I speak the blessing upon these people. I call them healed. I call them whole. I call them set free. And in the name of Jesus, I speak to any demonic spirit that's tormenting them. And I command them to release and be gone. I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, they're set free. Thank You, Father, for sending Your Son. Thank You for sending Him back soon, very soon, in the name of Jesus, Your Son. Amen.